Thank you. Real Life Church, it is so good to be here with you all. Um, I got to have that rock star welcome here 12 years ago. I'm sure all of you remember that, right? Uh, at the time, I was planning a church in Salt Lake City. Now we've relocated to Ojai. Uh, my wife and I have had a couple of kids. But one thing I can tell you is I have lost zero hair since then, 12 years ago. Uh, so I'm a little bit proud of, of that. But, but really, um, it is so good to be here with you guys. To, to know the story that you all have been telling over the last, man, 12 plus even longer years of who Jesus is and what he's about, how, how you've blessed me, my family, the church back then, and how you are blessing now. It is a gift to worship with you. It is a gift just to know you all. And I'm so excited that we get to be in this series, Real Hope. Because for me, man, I, I can't play the game. Like if, if church is just something where we, where we say things, but we don't mean it, where we talk about things, but they never come about, then I'm out. Like I'm done. A little of my story is, is I grew up in the Mormon faith, and, and at one point in my life at 18 years old, I realized that, man, I had to leave, that what was being said wasn't true. And so five years later, when I said, yes, Jesus, I'm in, it had to be real. It, it, it couldn't be fake. And so tonight, I want to share with you one of my favorite stories from the scriptures in a minute. We're going to dig into the Bible, and we're going to see how God has no patience for fake hope, and how Jesus steps in, and he leads us and embodies what real hope is. Well, a couple weeks ago, it was my wife's birthday, and, and I have been blessed with these two boys. One is 10, and one is 6, and they love celebrating. It doesn't matter what it is. I can just turn on the TV, and if a team's winning the championship that night, they're immediately that team's favorite, you know, fan, and they get excited, and they love it, and they really love it when it's their mom's birthday. And so I just love it because as a dad, like, I want her to know, like, she puts up with the three of us all the time, and she suffers for us and sacrifices for us. And I just, as a woman, I'm sure most of the time she's just like, why do they smell so bad, Right? And so her birthday comes around and we want to celebrate her. So I get them together like a week or so before and I'm like, guys, mom's birthday's coming. We got to dial it in. We got to ratchet it up. Like I want great cards. I want great gifts. Like let's do this. And so we go shopping and get her favorite treats. Like they make some amazing cards and art and stories and everything. And we hide them all away. But then we had this plan like to kick it off. We, we know that she likes her alone time in the morning. Uh, I'm the morning guy. She's normally really nice, but like in the morning, like mm, not so much. But anyway, she's not here tonight, so I can say that. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, she, um, she, uh, we wanted to surprise her. So when she got to the table for breakfast, she would have all of her treats there. She would have all of her presents there. It was just this picture of abundance. And so she could sit down, and then uh, as soon as she sat down, I was going to say, oh, I forgot the salt. And I was going to get up and I was going to go into the kitchen. I was going to go out our back door, go into the, the garage. And there we had these um, multiple bouquets of flowers. I would grab one, sneak around the front door, ring the doorbell. I would give her one. While I was giving her one, my next boy, he would do the same thing. So she just kept getting every time if we did it right, right? She would just keep getting knocks on the door, keep getting bouquets of flowers. We just wanted to celebrate her. When you're dealing with a 10 and 6-year-old, you never know how things are going to get pulled off. But they killed it. They were amazing. Like, and they were so excited, guys. I got up that morning. I got up kind of early. I wanted to make sure it was dialed in. Like 6 a.m., I thought I was going to have to wake them up. I get up, I come out. They're dressed, beds made, and they're just like, we're ready, Dad. We're going to do this, right? She comes out, and we get the tears and the hugs and it was an awesome way to kick off the day. At the same time, I was preparing this message, and it made me think, for God, if you know the Bible, and I, and I realize there's many of us that are here that, that, that don't. I went to church for about three years before I'd have ever called myself a Christian, and I didn't really know what was in the Bible. But in about the third chapter of the Bible, things go nutty. They go crazy. Human beings, we kind of reject God. We don't obey God. But there's a moment in that, in all of the chaos, where God says, I'm going to make this right. 
I'm going to bring real hope. And so for most of the Bible, the people are waiting for what this hope looks like. And as I was planning what, how to kick off my wife's birthday, I was like, what was it like for God to, to plan, to see what it would look like when hope really came? When Jesus not only was born, but when he moved into his ministry, when he started teaching and talking and calling people to him. And then I knew that this was the way he did it. The story we're going to look at tonight is the first miracle that Jesus steps into. It's the first time where he kind of plants the flag in the ground and announces to everybody that there's going to be a new day. There's going to be a new way. Hope just doesn't have to be like dreamed of, but it can be tasted. It can be experienced. It's not just an idea. It is a reality. You know how God does it? How would you do it if you were God? How would you announce Jesus? Well, God picks a unique way. Jesus doesn't show up at a concert, you know. He doesn't rise out of the stage. He doesn't come down on a, on a horse with a sword and a megaphone. He doesn't show up in our day where he can just live stream everybody. No, he goes to a wedding. And at the wedding... There's basically a, a, a planning, a banquet planning disaster. And if you're like, wah, wah, right? It's a little bit confusing. But then as you read it, then as you see what Jesus is doing, as you see what God is telling us, it begins to change everything. So let me read. I'm going to be in John chapter 2, and it says this. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him they don't have any wine. So he goes to this wedding, he's with his mom, his disciples are there, like the party is going. And then the wine runs out. Problem, Right? So she comes to Jesus and she says, they don't have any wine. And Jesus' answer to her is mind-blowing. He says, what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with you and me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. And then her response is even better. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. So there's this wedding. And what I need you to know in order to understand this is weddings then they were different than weddings today. Even the most elaborate wedding today. It, it's usually a one-day deal, even just an evening kind of thing. But in that day, these were kind of week-long festivities. These were parties that did not stop. They, they were the ways that families, they would show honor to their relatives. They would show honor to their child that was being married. This was a way that they kind of stood before the community and said, this is what our family name is all about. And so Jesus shows up and the party starts and the wine runs out. And Mary gets it. She knows that this is just not a small problem. She realizes that it's not just going to be, ah, we can't have any wine, the party's over. She realizes that this family is going to be shamed. She realizes that this family, as far as social status, as far as value in the community, is going to be reduced to nothing. And she wants to give them mercy. Mary knows something that most of the people at the wedding didn't, right? Right? She's known since the beginning that she's giving birth to this boy who's going to change everything. And so she goes to him. And she says, they have ran out of wine. She didn't ask him to run to, you know, the liquor store. She's like, you need to do something about it. Now there's a statement that Jesus says that I read you, right? Where he says to her, um, what does that have to do with you and me, woman? He says, my hour has not yet come. Now, I just want to bring this up because this is a totally different sermon. But what Jesus is doing is talking about um, 
His hour is not yet at hand where he would go to the cross. Any time in the book of John when he talks about it, it happens three more times when he talks about his time coming. It's about when he ultimately shows us what hope is. When he ultimately puts flesh on the line and dies for us and is willing to say to anyone and everyone, if you need mercy, come to me. Even if you are killing him, he would say, God, forgive them. But like I said, that's a whole other kind of path for another day. She just says, do whatever he tells you. Now, I'm not going to make you wait. I'm not going to make you wait and wonder what does he do. He takes the water and he turns it into wine. He performs his first miracle. And he starts to blow minds, right? He, he starts to take something that seemed impossible and make it possible. He starts to shout to the world, you want real hope. He is it. What he says in this moment is so powerful. He's showing all of us that our God, He doesn't just concern himself with the grandest things, with the greatest things. Rather, he concerns himself with all things. I don't know where you're coming from tonight. If you have that pit in your stomach, that that thing that keeps nagging at you, and it could be small or it could be huge. It could be massive or it could just be that thing that consistently trips you up. But what Jesus shouts in this miracle, when he goes to this wedding, when he's hanging out with his friends, when his mom comes to him with this problem, and he steps in, and he says, there won't be shame here. There will be hope. He says to every one of us, no matter what we bring to him, he will get right in to the middle of it. And that's absolutely real hope. Look at how it does it. It says, now six stone water jars have been set there for Jewish purification. This is a big deal. This was the way back in the day that Jews would show they were pure, they were clean, that they could go before God, that they had done the right things, that they had qualified. So Jesus doesn't choose these jars by chance. Now, six stone jars have been set there for Jewish purification. Each contains 20 or 30 gallons. I'll let you do the math, folks. Once he does this, it's going to be an epic party, okay? It's a lot of wine. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief servant. And they did. So they fill these jars of water, these jars with water. Jesus turns it into wine. Can you imagine what those servants, as they took it to the chief servant, we'll talk about who that is in a minute, and they knew that it was now wine. Can you imagine what was going through their mind? He had taken these jars they were to be used for a way, in a way for the, for, the, for the religious people of the day to show that they had qualified for God. To show that they deserved mercy. And what he did is he said, no, I will absolutely, whether you qualify for it or not, whether you figured out the religious pathway or not, I am going to give you mercy. But these people don't even know him at this point. Except for his mom and his disciples, they don't know who he is, but he's showering mercy on them. He's showing them abundance. What do I mean by that? Well, throughout the Bible, when when there is wine and it is present, that is a symbol of God's presence. He is saying, I am here. I don't know if you know this, but there are... um, over 10 verses throughout the Bible from the beginning to the end where we're invited to taste and see that God is good. And it's like in this moment, Jesus is saying, like literally taste and see how good I am. 
And what he shouts to us is that if we want to have real hope, if we want to really know who he is, we must experience his mercy. It must be something that we, we take in. In this case, they're going to drink it. In your case, it might be you have to receive it. But it's not something that you qualify for, and it's not just something that you talk about. It's something that you have to go through, a process of receiving and trusting and depending on him. It's something to actually be lived. Many of you know this. This is the difference between knowing about Jesus and actually knowing Jesus. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, I can tell you facts about him. We could meet for weeks, and we could talk about who Jesus is and write down all of the things that people have taught about him, all the things he's said about himself. But there's a difference between knowing about him and actually knowing him. Some of you in here know exactly what I'm talking about. For those three years I told you that I went to a church I would go to classes, every class they would offer. I would read every book they would tell me. And at the end, they were like, Kyle, we've run out of classes, okay, bro? Like, you know all about Jesus. The question is, do you actually want to really know him? And those are two very, very different things. Because if we want to know real hope, we have to know his real mercy. And that takes vulnerability. And that takes us saying, yeah, I actually need a savior. Yeah, actually, I have this shame. And, and in order for it to go away, I need to give it to you. And that means I need to talk about it or share it with you, God. And I don't know if I want to do that. I have these things that I hold tight to, and I don't want to let go of them. See, the Israelites... They had taken a relationship with God and they had turned it into rituals. And they had turned it into a system. And that had created people who were in and that had created people who were out. And today many of us reject that. But all we do is we just talk about who Jesus is. We say that we know him. But we really just know about him. In this moment, Jesus is saying, mercy must be experienced. If we want to know real hope, we must actually taste it. And I just want to be real with you folks. That is so hard for me. Because I want to be in control. And I'll be honest, I like the idea that Jesus offers me mercy, but I don't want to admit that I actually need mercy. There's a few moments that always stick in my head about this. And one was in 2013, uh, we were getting ready to have our first baby. And we lived in Salt Lake City, Utah, where it gets cold, like real cold, not California cold. You know, we're like, woo, it's 58, right? No, there it's like, woo, it's 12, you know? And so my boy was due in February, and we're getting into the winter months, and we'd had this crazy calamity of stuff happen. We found out that in Utah at the time, um, the insurance we had did not cover pregnancies. Yeah, insurance companies were smart about Utah, right? Anyway, um, and so we had to come out of pocket for that, like dig into our bank accounts. And then, um, and then we had this massive issue with our water main in front of our house. And we had to repair the whole thing. Another huge chunk of money coming out of our savings. And so by the time we get to this moment of, 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 um, of him about to be born, uh, I wake up one morning. It's November. It's getting cold. I turn on the furnace and I just hear like click, click, nothing. So I call the heating company, and they come out. It's like, furnace is dead. <sighs> and I'm like, let's just put it on a card because our savings have dwindled. And my wife's like, I must pray about it. And I'm like, pray about it? Like, God wants us to have heat? <laughs> She's like, let's just pray about it. And I'm like, I don't want to be the dude who's making his pregnant wife freeze, right? That doesn't look good. But we pray about it. That was fine. Then she says, let's tell our small group about it. I'm like, first idea is pray about it. I wasn't totally on board. I came on board. This idea, not cool with, right? 
I didn't like to say that I needed something. I was the pastor of the church. I wanted to show that I had it together. She's like, now is the time for you to see if you listen to the sermons that you preach. I was like, ouch. So we told our small group. And our small group said, we'll pray about it. And I think I said to our small group, I don't think we need to. I think God's cool if we buy a furnace. So we prayed. The next week, they're like, let's pray again. We prayed. I'm like, guys, it keeps getting colder. How long do we pray? Two, week after, two weeks after we first tell them we pray, at the end of the prayer, I look down at my feet, and there are 18 $100 bills. Amazing gift that I then had to receive. And my pride had to say, God, I want to taste your mercy, not just know about it. I want to know your grace, not just the idea of it. I want to have real hope. Another time, um, right after we moved to Portland, Oregon, this is 15 plus years ago, uh, we're in a new town, no really, no, no real, hardly any, no, no one, and uh, my wife's father tragically dies. We get on an airplane to head back to Las Vegas where we were from, and, and I just knew as a husband, like I had Nothing, meaning I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I, I had nothing. And we get to the airport in Las Vegas, and, and if you ever went down, what am I saying? Lots of you have been there. Anyway, when we go down the escalator at the baggage claim, you go down the escalator into the baggage claim, and I have my arm around my wife just as I had pretty much the whole day, and we're going down the baggage claim, and we get to the bottom, and all of our old small group is there from our church. And they just embrace my wife. And they just embrace me. We had to receive real hope. My own baptism. I told you I grew up in the Mormon church, so I had been baptized for dead people. I had been baptized over 300 times. So when they were like, Kyle, it's time to get baptized, I was like, I'm the Michael Jordan of baptism. I don't need to do it again. Okay? But then I had patient, kind people. Show me what it was to really trust God, to respond to his mercy, receive his mercy, humble myself, not be in control, and know real hope. What is your shame tonight? What is your struggle? What, what is your disaster? See, Jesus is saying, I, I will be right in the middle of that. I, I will show up right in the midst of it. I will provide real hope. It is for every single one of us to know him, not just know about him. See, this is why I love church planting. Because what church planting says is it says, God, we're taking you seriously. You said go anywhere and everywhere and tell everybody about us that we're going to do it. And so we show up and we start these churches and what people hear and what people begin to understand is, man, there is a God who does want to know me. There are people who love him and for some crazy reason, they want to keep telling every, anyone and everyone about him. This is what I love about real life. Do you know what you've allowed us to do? Through your generosity already, through your kindness, through your partnership, You've allowed us to reach people already. You've allowed us on, on Tuesday, on July 4th, we're going to throw a massive party for the whole valley because we just want them to know about a God of hope. And that is because you all trust a God of hope. This is why your participation matters. This is why we're all called to that thing that we call the Great Commission. Because when Jesus stepped and did his first miracle, when he showed us that mercy can actually be experienced and known, it changed us. And so we have to go share that same message with anyone and everyone. Look at how this ends up. It says this. 
when the chief servant, so the chief servant gets this, and you need to know, this isn't like a wedding coordinator. This guy was like, he was amazing. Everybody in the town would know him. He would be the one who would either communicate, you were an awesome family, who did amazing things, or like, stay away from their weddings. So when the chief servant, ta- chief servant tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew. So he calls the groom and he told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first. Then, after people have drunk freely, the inferior, but you have kept the fine wine until now. He's basically saying, dude, you're, you're a class act. You're amazing. Usually what people do is they give the fine wine first, and then after people do not really even know their name, they bring out the cheap stuff. He goes, no, like what you do is you keep up in the ante. You keep bringing out the stuff that's better and better and better and better. And you see what God is telling us? Because we know who that is, right? We know who the one who has provided it is. Like the Lord of this party, the master of this banquet, of mercy, of grace, of redemption is Jesus. And he just keeps bringing the good stuff. Like if you thought just the first time you trusted in him, he was going to bring grace. No, no, no. He just keeps bringing it. And it just keeps tasting better and better and better and better. You go sideways, he'll keep bringing it better and better. You realize there's stuff you didn't even know you had. He'll keep bringing it better and better. Folks, this is real hope. See, mercy must be experienced. But once you actually experience it, once you taste it, once you keep trusting in it, What you know is joy, because joy always follows mercy. I think a lot of times we think I'm going to bring Jesus my weight. I'm going to bring him my shame. I'm going to bring him my struggle. He's going to hear me, and I'm going to have to go hang my head for a little while. Like give my penance for a little bit. But no. What real hope is, is Jesus says, get your head up. See, sons and daughters of God, they don't hang their heads. Sons and daughters of God who have trusted in that cross, who have believed and let that blood clean them, they they don't hang their heads. They look up. And they know that what's on the other side of mercy is real joy. If you hear the whisper that says, hang your head, that might be your flesh. That might be your mind. That might be your brain talking. If you hear that whisper that says he, he doesn't want you to know joy, that, that's most likely Satan. That's something that is not true. He hung on that cross and he said, you are forgiven. It is finished. And what he finished, you can't start again. Jesus gives us this mercy to experience and then he gives us this amazing gift of joy that follows it. This is real hope that is for every single one of us. The real master of the banquet, the real Lord of the party. He comes and with this this, this miracle, he says, I came to rule and I came to reign and I came to do it with joy. You don't have to qualify for it and you don't have to just talk about it. But you can surrender to it and you can receive it. Receive it. Sometimes um, in church world, we know people inside and out think Christians are boring. I only think we're boring when we're not experiencing mercy. Because when we're experiencing mercy, the joy of God wells, in up, wells up in us and we just cannot stop talking about it. That's why we wanted to, to kind of kick off the ministry of our church plan in Ojai. We wanted to start with a party. Because if anybody should be good at partying, it should be the people whose God, whose Savior, get his first miracle at a party, right? Like we should have that joy because we've experienced that joy. This is real question for me often though comes to this it's like how do we live this like I I can read it and I I can even like have those times in my life where I taste it and it's going great but then I can find myself in that moment in that space where it just feels like God how do I get back to that 
How do I live this? And the answer is in this passage as well. Do you remember what Mary said? She came to him, and she's like, they, they, they ran out of wine. And he tells her, like, hey, what does this have to do with me? She gave us the answer to how we live this right then. She said, do whatever he tells you. See, if Jesus is our Lord, if he is our Savior, then we listen to whatever he tells us. So what is he telling you today? What is he inviting you into right now? See, the call for anyone, for all of us, is to be people who go and share his message, live his message, tell anyone and everyone about his message. The passage says go over all the world. And folks, I went to seminary and tried to find a way out of that. I even learned the language. And when it says go everywhere, go all over the world, unfortunately the translation is everywhere all over the world. And we're all called to do it. Whether God tells us to go across the street, across the country, or around the globe. So how do we live this? Well, we do whatever he tells us. And right now, folks, in, in Ojai, we believe he is telling us to plant a church that just screams real hope, invites anyone and everyone to know real hope. And what I want to do is invite you all to join us in that. We have this party on Tuesday. This would be a great way to dip your toe in it. And what we want is we want 25 real-life volunteers to come and to help us live this out. Do you know how amazing it will be when these people show up and they're keep asking the question, why are you doing this? What is this for? And every time it gives us the opportunity to share the incredible message of Jesus. And so you can join us. There's a QR code that's on the side screens. You can scan that. You can come. It's on Tuesday, July 4th. It's from 4.30 to 9.30. That's the shift of volunteers. So you can even get your parade on in the morning, and you can come do your fireworks with us, right? And if you're like, I don't have any special skills, well, we got, we got jobs where you don't need special skills, and we got jobs if you're an incredible, you know, tattoo artist. They're fake tattoos. I wish they were real. Um, or you want to paint some faces. You want to serve some hamburgers. You want to just welcome people? Come and join us. Or maybe God's stirring something deeper in you. Some of you have been around real life when you've planted churches and you've sent people to be part of a launch team for a season. And if that's in you, like if you want to come join us from, from literally the end of July through the end of December, you can go on that QR code and you can sign up for that as well. But this is our opportunity to take a step and tell anyone and everyone that hope is absolutely real and hope is absolutely found in Jesus. Will you pray with me? God, you are so good. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you would bring Jesus, that you would send Jesus and he would step on the scene and through a wedding begin to reframe begin to redefine what it means to trust in you, to be in relationship with you. God, would you open all of our ears tonight? You're telling each one of us what it looks like to follow you and to trust you. And would we listen to you? God, you are good. We thank you and praise you and know that you are absolutely real hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.